Well, again, good afternoon, everyone. And we're going to be starting a new study tonight in the uh, book of Colossians. Our study is going to come from um, the first 14 verses of the book. And Chuck Swindoll titles this Praying for Knowledge of the Truth. Um, the book of Colossians is going to help us to look at the sufficiency of Christ. And so the introduction to this particular study is that Christ is sufficient as our Lord, as our life, and as our leader. Uh, again, uh, the epistle of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. Uh, time and, and writing of this letter, as we've been discussing, it's one of the four prison epistles, which includes Ephesians and Philippians and Philemon. It was written uh, approximately between um, 60 and 62 AD. The general consensus is that this epistle was written while Paul was imprisoned in Rome in his first imprisonment. Uh, the, a little bit about the city of Colossae. Uh, Colossae was located about 100 miles east of Ephesus, which is in now what is modern day Turkey. Uh, Colossae was once a populous center of commerce, but by the time of Paul and by the time of this writing, it was in decline, having been overshadowed by its neighbor, Hierapolis and Laodicea, where churches also were being formed. Uh, Coloss Colossae exerted almost no influence on the early church history. It was mostly a pagan city with a strong intermingling of Jews, which likely explains the nature of some of the problems that arose there uh, for the believers in that church, that new church in Colossae. The church at Colossae was, um, was planted by Epaphras, one of the missionaries that served with Paul as he was doing these missionary journeys, uh, possibly with the help of Philemon, who we'll uh, talk about again. That's one of the prison epistles who served as one of the leaders in that church. And you'll see that um, outlined clearly in the book of Philemon. And by the time we get to where we are at this point in the church, a dim fog of religious pluralism had rolled into the church, uh, clouding the church's spiritual discernment and muddling the clarity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it, was the, it was this overtone that was going on in the church that was causing so much uh, confusion. Uh, Chuck Swindoll says the ever shifting wind of vain philosophies blew ankleless believers farther from the safe harbor of the faith. Some faced this spiritual crisis with a rigid legalism, resorting to do's and don'ts with no basis in scripture. So they, they started to uh, look to themselves and, and look at the legalism that was uh, a part of their culture and, and looking at do's and don'ts that did not have anything to do with what, what was written in the scripture. Others in that same church retreated into a quasi-magical mysticism that tended towards superstition. But these are the things that are going on in the church in Colossae. Drifting aimlessly, believers slowly sank into the murky waters of spiritual concession and moral compromise, heading dangerously towards sh a shipwreck of their faith. And, and, and when you get into those kind of do's and don'ts and mysticism and, and superstitions uh, that you bring into your religion, it, it starts to take you in different directions. And that's what Paul wants us to understand about this church at Colossae as he um, introduces himself to them. Uh, and these words describe the prevailing conditions of the first century Colossian church in the heart of Asia Minor. This church was in Asia Minor, uh, again, which is modern day Turkey. And so the images here of a Christian church suffering from cultural capitulation and spiritual surrender could also describe many 21st century churches that have drank too deeply from the surrounding culture. And, and as we've gone forward and we've been dealing with, uh, with COVID and all the things that are going on, uh, you can see that there are some things that we need to think about. Anyone who digs deeply into this brief but powerful letter to the Colossians soon realizes that these ancient words still describe what we face today. Uh, we face a lot of things today. The heresies of that day are still flourishing in our modern times. Paul's exhortation to the wayward believers of Colossae still speak directly to us living in the towns and cities of the 21st century. And so 
as we go through this book, we want to take special notice of certain things and make sure that as we do, we understand what Paul is truly com communicating uh, to the Colossian believers. And so the Colossians, like many believers today, needed a drastic course correction in their faith as they moved forward. And so this is uh, just a little diagram that shows you a little bit about where uh, Colossae was located uh, in that area. And to give you a little bit more information, it says it was located in modern day Turkey, close to Laodicea and Hierapolis. It was an ancient trade route from the Euphrates Valley to Ephesus. The church was started by Epaphras. And here they can say a little bit that possibly Timothy was a part of it, but Paul uh, does not say that uh, while Paul was in Ephesus. Homeland to uh, uh, Philemon and Epaphras. And it was written by Paul in approximately 61 by the urging of Epaphras, likely the same year that Paul wrote Philemon. So let's take a look. The purpose of this letter, as we talked a little bit before, uh, was uh, in response to this deep need for correction from the false teachings that were going on in the church and the report that false teachers were denigrating the deity of Jesus by teaching that he was not actually God. And so we have to look out for those things. Paul wrote this letter to tackle this issue head on. He, he wanted to make sure that he got in front of this. Uh, and so that he might bring his wisdom to bear on this difficult and trying situation in the church at Colossae. It was critical to Paul uh, that this church know God in his greatness and glory rather than in the defective views given them by the false teachers. And we'll see all of that as we go forward. This is just the introduction to Colossians. And so in light of all of that and the response that Paul had for the church, uh, there are three purposes that seem to have been in Paul's mind as he wrote the, this letter to the Colossians. First, he wanted to show the deity and the supremacy of Christ in the face of the Colossian heresy. Uh, so he wanted to make sure that, that the church knew uh, that Christ is supreme, that, that, that Christ is, in fact, God. And secondly, he wanted to lead this, this brand new church, those people who were uh, uh, spiritually immature. He wanted to lead those believers into spiritual maturity. And then thirdly, he wanted to make sure that he informed them about where he was and who he was and what his state of affairs was, and also to engage and elicit their prayers on his behalf. Are there any questions? The theme of this letter, <clears throat> the theme of this letter as- uh, I'm as sorry. As early, is that Jesus Christ is sufficient Hello? as our Lord, as our life, and our leader. And Paul is going to make a case for that as he goes through this book of, uh, of um, Colossians that we might see in his writings and his sincere uh, prayers for this church just who Christ is. And he, he, wants, and he, he tells us that the young believers at Colossae uh, still lack the deep-rooted, mature faith in the sufficiency of the person and the work of Christ necessary to withstand this onslaught of worldly philosophies and man-made religion. And I think we find those kind of things even in our church today. Uh, many of us, uh, many people in our churches are still struggling with some of these conspiracy theories and some of these philosophies that are out there. And we just need to be spiritually prayed up and listening for the Lord as we go forward. They were under attack from false teachers who were downgrading Christ's identity, saying that he wasn't God as the son of God. They were degrading the sufficiency of his saving work and denigrating his absolute authority as heir and ruler over all creation. And so that's the church that we find ourselves um, now about to discuss. The key verse in this particular book is verse two, uh, chapter two, verses nine and 10. And it reads, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead Father, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and all power. And so that's the overall arching message that Paul wants to communicate to us 
as we go through this book and look at just who Christ is. For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the God in bottom. Meaning that there is nothing about God that you don't see when you look at Christ. And he says, and because of that, you are complete in him. Because he's the head of all powers and all principalities and all things. And so we want to keep that in mind. Let me ask that everybody mute themselves. I'm usually able to do that, but I will try not to. Okay, so and as we move forward, I, I, I put this little chart in there because I wanted to show you uh, just how this how this is working. So Paul, Paul gives us a look at Christ is preeminent in all things, and he wants to talk about the sufficiency and the superiority of Christ as our Savior. And so as we come to this little book of Colossians, you can see that it's neatly divided uh, in half with the first portion. Uh, looking at verses one and verse two, uh, they are going to show us the preeminence of Christ. First and foremost, in everything, the Christian life should reflect the priority that Christ is preeminent. And as we move forward, you'll see that in this particular little um, um, uh, um, It's a um, chart outline, babe. It's a chart outline chapters. Chart. In this chart, you see that Colossians 1 and 2, as you can see, is doctrinal, doctrinal and corrected. And that uh, it tells us that all about Christ as our Lord, talks about the work, the person and the work of Christ. That's in verses 2 and verse, verses 1. I mean, chapter, chapters. Chapters 1. I'm, I'm fine. I'm nervous. I got to get myself together here. No, slow down. You're good to go. Chapters 1 and chapters 2. In chapter 3 and You're chapter family. 4 you will see that uh, Christ presents that Christ is, this part is practical and reassuring. So you'll find some practical application as we look at chapters three and chapter four. We also see here that um, it presents in chapter three, Christ is our life. In chapter four, it presents Christ as our love. And then it says that Christ, it, it presents to us the peace, and the presence of Christ. And so this little particular, this is Paul's pattern of presentation as we move forward. So that's how he's going to move through these four chapters in the book of Colossians. Okay. And so as we get into this first over, uh, part of chapter one, we're gonna overview it a little bit. It says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so that's the first thing that we're gonna talk about as we move forward. In Colossians 1, 1, 20, 1 through 29, Paul takes a closer look at the implications of the sufficiency of Christ's supreme person and work in all areas of our lives. And so we just, we want to make sure that we, we keep that in mind as we go forward. He begins by expressing his deep gratitude for the Colossian believers. His, uh, his authentic care and concern for them is evident in this prayer that we'll be discussing in chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. And then with a thankful heart, he prays for the indispensable spiritual virtues of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Each of those points um, are part of the will of God for us as we go forward. And we'll see that in verses 9 through 14. We'll also encounter one of the most profound and powerful articulations of the deity and the humanity of Christ and his absolute lordship over all things considered one of the early hymns about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 reminds us that Christ alone is preeminent over everything. He is fully human and fully divine, the source of and the ruler over all creation and the one who reconciles heaven and earth. And so we'll see that as we go forward. And so Paul uses this magnificent hymn in uh, 50, verses 15 through 20 to encourage and challenge the Colossians to continue in their faith in Jesus as Lord, explaining to them that authentic ministry derives from that kind of faith and from the hope that they receive from the proclamation of the gospel. And we'll find that in uh, verses 21 through 29. And so now we want to talk about praying for the knowledge of the truth 
in verses 1 through 14. Throughout the life of any ministry, false teachers tend to target new believers for those who haven't properly matured in their faith. They rarely go after the well-trained Christians, the pastors, the teachers, or the theological thinkers in the church. And if, if you think about that, that makes sense. If false teachers had solid biblical evidence and strong doctrinal uh, arguments, they'd find ready ears among the more biblically and theologically astute. Instead, like ravenous predators, false teachers prowl around the edges of the flock scoping out the stragglers, the newborns, the spiritually weak and sick, easy victims of deception and confusion. And Swindoll says, why, why is that? Why, why is it that, that false teachers are looking for those people who might not be able to defend themselves in a way that would, uh, would move them forward in a positive light? First, false teachers know that those who are well grounded in scripture and mature in their theology will be centered on the truth. And, and that's something we can, we, can, we can think about and talk about a little bit more. They won't be easily led astray. True knowledge that comes from God's words strengthens and stabilizes the believer. And that's something we want to keep in mind. That's why we started to show ourselves approved. When we, when we look around us and, and, and see what's going on, we know that we have to be in the word because that's what's going to strengthen us and that's what's going to stabilize us. That's what's going to carry us through the days and the nights of, of challenge and change as we go forward. Second, false teachers know that those, who, those with a growing knowledge of God will have a greater awareness of doctrinal lies. They often know heresies by name. And so again, uh, just like the first statement says, the first why, uh, false teachers know that those people who, are, who are, have a growing knowledge, those of us who are in Bible study, who are constantly in, in the Bible, <clears throat> that we have a greater awareness of what is truly the gospel and what isn't. And many times we've heard of, or we know of, or we've learned of the heresies. And so you were not easily fooled and we're not easily uh, tricked uh, by those things that come rolling down the path. And third, mature believers have had experiences concerning the difference between truth and falsehood, between evil, between light and darkness. And so the why they don't really ask the people who are mature are these three things that, that would keep us and help us to stand firm as we go forward. But in the small, newly established church in Colossae, false teachers were trying to take advantage of the believer's spiritual youth and ignorance. Whatever the spiritual disease brought by these teachers, worldly philosophies, pagan mysticism, Jewish legalism, or pious asceticism, the truth was the same. Knowledge of the truth of Christ Jesus and acceptance of his sufficiency for all things. That is indeed what would keep us as we go forward. Amen. 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 So as we come to the first uh, few verses, in the first two verses of, the, of this chapter, Paul says, and, and it's standard for Paul, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul begins this letter in his customary fashion, the identity of the author and the audience. Uh, and though the letter is from Paul, he also mentions Timothy, which he does in several of his letters. Um, and at, at the time Colossae was written, about a decade had passed since Paul had invited uh, young Timothy, who was a convert from Lystra in Asia Minor, to participate in his ministry, in his missionary work. For more than a decade now, Timothy had, had accompanied Paul through some very exciting and dangerous adventures, including establishing churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, 
Athens and Corinth. An assistant Paul throughout his third missionary journey, which climaxed with Paul's arrest and imprisonment in Rome. And you'll see that there in the book of Acts. We can't be certain whether this mention of Timothy uh, indicates that the epistle was or in some way uh, sense, uh, in some sense was co-authored by him or whether Paul, uh, Timothy served as Paul's amensu. Amanuensis. Amanuensis. Now, I, I knew how to pronounce that word until just now. Okay. Does somebody have a question? <laughs> you know, all the times I teach, I'm usually never nervous. I don't know what this is. Hey, Sister Lonnie, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I apologize. I raised my hand earlier, but I'm, I'm driving. I'm not sure how this Bluetooth is coming through, but uh, I had a question earlier, if, it, if it's not too late to ask uh, okay, something nice. you said. It, it was real simple. I was trying to understand, and, and I think we discussed it before. When, when Paul wrote these um, prison epistles, were they all written um, uh, during one imprisonment, or did he, were they spaced out? Because uh, They, they were that. written over a two-year period of time between AD 60 to 62. So, and, and, so they, they were not written as one at one time to four letters, but the four letters came over that 24 month period of time falling within yeah. 60 to 80, 62. And it was his, it was the same house arrest time period. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's thank what you. you were asking. Is that what yes, you were asking? Yes. Right. It was thank the you, same but... time frame. Yes. Right. Uh, Paul thank was you. under house arrest in Rome at the time awaiting trial he, he was going to go before caesar and so it was the same period of time that Thank all of these were written and of course you saw that they were um ephesians colossians philippians and philemon were the four letters that were written right. during that time period okay. amen just as clarification now the last letter that paul wrote was second timothy and he was released from that first imprisonment after two years Right. Uh, he did some travel, he writes, that, but he knows he's going to be rearrested and uh, does not know his fate, but he does write to Second Timothy, that letter, the, 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 the book uh, to, uh, entitled Second Timothy, and then we know that Paul is rearrested and condemned and died without writing anything about that particular event. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So part of the uh, part of the letter written in the first person is written part of the letters are written in the first person plural we suggesting that Paul and Timothy both express their sentiments uh, as we look at verses um, three through twelve. However, the letter abruptly switches if we look at verse twenty three when Paul says I Paul, and from that point on. When employing the first pop person, the letter primarily uses the singular form uh, of, of, of identification. I, Paul, me, I mean, I, those are the things that it uses. And regardless of Timothy's involvement in the writing or the sending of this epistle, clearly the primary authority behind it was the Apostle Paul. And so while Timothy uh, is, is identified in that very first verse, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Uh, Timothy could have been his secretary. That's what that word amanuense means, secretary or scribe, okay? So that's what that means. The recipients of the letter were the saint and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. And so Paul, Paul, Paul clearly uh, sends this letter to those who are believers, those who are believers in Colossae. Uh, though they were almost 1,000 miles away, the bond they enjoyed through the Holy Spirit made Paul and the Colossian members of the same spiritual family. They served the same father and were brothers and sisters in Christ. As such, Paul felt obligated to aid their spiritual well-being. And so because they were Christians, look at the saints, because they were saints and faithful brethren in Christ, 
Paul felt like it was his duty, his responsibility as, 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 as an apostle to be a part of and to aid them in whatever was going on in their spiritual life. However, it would, be, it would have been easy for him to think Colossae never ever be, been, never even been there. Paul had not been to Colossae. Uh, he had only heard of, of the Colossians. If they're having problems, it's not my responsibility. Instead, he went out of his way to intervene for the spiritual health of people he knew only by proxy. And that's what we, we do too. When we pray for folks that uh, we don't know, members of, of, of our jobs, people that give us information, that we go out of our way just to, to say something or to spiritually intervene for them. And that's who we are as, as Christians. And so the phrase grace to you and peace, though it was Paul's standard salutation, was particularly appropriate. The grace he was extending to the Colossians by his letter and his desire for their peace made this not merely a mindless formula like a flip it, God bless you, after you sneeze. Paul genuinely desired grace and peace for his readers, even though he hadn't met them face to face. And so as we finish off those, uh, uh, that, that particular two verses, uh, we go now to the second uh, set of verses, Colossians 3 through 8, where Paul is going to pray even more about the faith of these Colossians. We give, and here's what it says, verses 3 through 8. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all the brethren, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declare to us your love in the spirit. And so Paul is writing to them again about their situation. Paul's authentic care and concern for the Colossians is clearly seen in the prayer of thanksgiving in verses three through eight. Paul hadn't even met the people for whom he was praying. And, and keep that in mind because I think it's noteworthy for us to really think a little bit about what this says. Paul hadn't met these people for whom he was praying, but he was thankful for them because of what he heard. He had not seen them. He didn't know any more about them than what had been told to him, but, but he's thankful for them and he is praying earnestly for them. Uh, by the next chapter, Paul would sharpen his tongue, pointing out areas of grave concern and calling the Colossians to get back to the straight and narrow path. But he also expressed his gratitude and his praise for them up front, and he set a positive tone. And, and that's the thing that, that we want to keep in mind as we think about praying and as we think about not just praying, but praying for those that we may not have met, that we don't really know. What, what do we do with that? How does that really work? What does that look like when we start to think about it? As, as Paul said, uh, talking about those, those faithful folk who are the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, when we find ourselves in that position, uh, what does it mean to do that? For an audience that knew him only as the apostle, his prayer of heartfelt thanksgiving for them is intended to disarm them with grace. I like that statement. Um, what does it mean to disarm someone with grace? You, you take away all of their defenses because of how you have engaged them. And that's what we want to remember as we continue to go through this. Though so Paul didn't know the Colossians personally, he knew that all believers needed growth and strength in the theological virtues of faith, love, and hope. Now think about that. 
and, and I want you to think about that because I believe that as we as we start to deal with the fact of praying for and interceding for people that we may not have met, that we may not know, uh, one of the things that we can keep in our minds is that there are some things that all of us as believers need, growth and strength in the theological virtues, listen to what he says, of faith, love, and hope. All of us need that. That, that's, that's part of our signature as Christians. And so we need, uh, we need to grow and to be strengthened in those virtues, okay? These three pillars of the Christian life are fundamental. And Paul expresses his thankfulness to God that the Colossians are not lacking in these essentials. I, I love that part. So let's take a look at these virtues, these three pillars of the Christian life as as Swindoll has characterized them uh, and see what they are and how they work in our lives. Faith is mentioned first in this trio because the Christian life begins with faith. And you can see that right there in Ephesians as, as is outlined here in our handout. For it says, without it, it's impossible to please God. That comes out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. Without faith is what the scripture tells us. It is impossible to please God. And so Paul mentions that first in this trio as we take a look at these fundamentals of Christian life. <clears throat> From this fountainhead of faith flows love. Once the Holy Spirit enters our heart, then love wells up, love for God and love for others. And so secondly, he brings in, okay, faith. Once our faith is at work in us and we're trusting God for everything, then we start to learn how to love one another after we've learned how to love God. It's hard to love others when you can't love God or you don't love God. And so that's what Paul is, is, is expressing to us as we go forward here. We always thank God when we pray for you. Okay. <clears throat> and so we need to keep that in mind. And so, in fact, in Paul's list of the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five, love comes first. A little bit different, right? Paul notes in uh, one four here in Colossians that he had heard of the Colossians love for all the saints. He had not experienced it. He had heard of it. And, and when somebody hears of your love for someone else, that means you have been demonstrating something that's observable. You, you've got some, there's some tangibles on your love <clears throat> that can be seen uh, as you walk out whatever you're walking out in the midst of those people who are observing. These believers were demonstrating a God-given capacity for unconditional love. These are the, the believers in Colossae, the church in Colossae. And so Paul had heard of this. He had not seen any of this. And he, he expresses the fact that he's heard of it. <clears throat> then Paul mentions hope in, in verse five. Look what he says. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Though this is a future heavenly hope, hope it does not distract us from trusting God and loving others in the here and now. Keep that in mind. It, 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 hope is always future. If, 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 if you got it now, you don't have to hope for it, okay? And so, so, so Paul mentions hope here, uh, uh, showing that there is, is a future reach of your faith, of your faith. And so quite the opposite, our assurance of heavenly reward should inspire us to greater faith and greater love. Not in the by and by, but right now. But right now. Is there any questions or any comments as we delve in these two verses, four and five? Uh, just an added uh, thought that um, I often refer to faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these are being love as the salvific trio that brings us to salvation through Christ or in Christ through the grace that we have from God. So, yeah. Amen. I agree with Swindoll's uh, definition and assessment. Thank you, Pastor. Anybody else? Any other comments or, or questions? Okay. 
So actually faith, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, about these imperatives. Uh, Swindoll says, and I love what he says here and, and why he says it. He says, and he's gonna give us this for all three of them. He said, faith looks back to the anchor of salvation, Jesus's person and his work. And, and that, that's Christology. Christology is a part of theology that's concerned with the nature and the work of Christ, including such things as his incarnation, the resurrection, and his human and divine nature and, nature and their relationship to us and to God. So, 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 so Christ, Christology is, is, is another, is a, the, is a theological concept that looks at the nature and the work of Jesus Christ. And so Paul and so Paul tells so Swindoll helps us to look back, says that faith looks back to the anchor of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And, and what that means is he's looking at the work. What did he do? And who is he? Yeah, Christology is the uh, branch of systematic theology that looks specifically as Jesus Christ at his person works and um, and contribution to humanity salvation. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Are there questions? Any questions or any thoughts? Okay, we'll go on. So we just looked at faith, and then he comes to tell us that love looks around. I like that. Building up the body of Christ through selfless service toward one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, 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 so as we as we deal with this, you know, faith looks back. I mean, yeah, faith looks back. Love looks around, building up the body of Christ. And then hope, like we said before, looks ahead to the unalterable promise of God, the Father, that he will one day usher us into his presence. So, so these are the pillows. These, these, these are, are, are the pillows of Christianity. Uh, of the Christian life that that helps us to move forward in these in these ways, okay? This inseparable theological virtue, these inseparable theological virtues form the bedrock upon which everything else in the Christian life rests. okay? Faith, love, and hope, or faith, hope, and love, or hope, love, and faith, however you put them, they form what Swindoll refers to as the bedrock upon which everything else in the Christian life rests. And he just explained to us why. When our lives are anchored by faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ, a love for God and others comes naturally. I'm gonna say that again. When our lives are anchored by faith in Jesus Christ, a love for God and others comes naturally. Why do you think that is? And brings harmony and unity. God is love and they that loveth God knoweth God because God is love. Amen. And it brings harmony and unity. So that's something that we keep in mind. And so when you, when you, when you start to step out and look at the world that we live in today, and, and, so what do we see? We see that there's probably a great lack of faith in Jesus that, that has not produced love for Christ or for each other. And, and, and consequently, we find little harmony and absolutely almost no unity. So as we, as we look around us, we see those things. Both faith and love point to and are strengthened by a confident hope that will get us through the reoccurring trials and struggles of life. What a great statement. Faith and love point to and are strengthened by hope. The kind of hope that'll get us through the reoccurring trials and struggles of life. And so Paul in his prayer for the Colossians is pointing all of these things out as he writes this letter that is going to be uh, uh, distributed, going to be carried to the church. And, and the other thing that happens here, they call it the churches at Colossae because in Hierapolis, 
and in Laodicea, churches are now growing up. And Paul's intent is not just to share this letter with the Colossians, but also to share this letter with those churches that are coming up, the young churches in Hierapolis and in Laodicea. So this, this would have been uh, uh, um, a letter that would be um, communicated around the region of uh, Colossae. Continuing this prayer, Paul expands on the subject of the gospel, which they had uh, given notable reception. Let's see what he has to say. First, he says, the gospel has come to you. Look at verse six, which has come to you as it has also in all the world. The gospel has come to you. Epaphras, a coworker of Paul and a fellow servant of Christ, was the one who had brought the saving message to the Colossians. And you'll see, in, he's mentioned in verse seven there where it says, and you also, as you also learn from Epaphras. So he is mentioned in that verse. Point being that nobody is born knowing the good news, okay? People don't discover it on their own. They need somebody to tell them. The gospel comes to us through a messenger. And look what Paul says in Rome, in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, Paul puts it this way. How, shall, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And so God sent preachers and those who he, he given the responsibility of preaching, he sent them to, um, to us to bring his word. Okay, continuing in this prayer, Paul expands on the subject of the gospel again. Secondly, Paul says that the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing throughout the world. There in verse six again, that he says the same thing. Uh, as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, bringing forth fruit. And so the ministry of Epaphras uh, to the Colossians was just one example of many missionary efforts by which believers were sharing their faith with the lost world, with the lost world. Point being that since the gospel has been fruitful in transforming the Colossians lives, and that's us too, the gospel has been fruitful in transform, <coughs> transforming our lives. The Colossians themselves should likewise be involved in passing on the faith to those around them. <coughs> if they do this, I don't know what's going on. Paul was commending them for not bottling up the good news they had received, but rather proclaiming it to those around them. <coughs> I'm trying. Okay. Are there any questions? I can. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll go on. First, yes. First lady. Yes. Go ahead. I may have missed it, um, but what I was wondering and listening to you, Paul is locked up, right? Am I correct? He's in jail now. He is under house arrest now. What that, means, yes, what that means is, is that he has with him guards. He has free reign to do some things. He's not in a jail cell where he can't get out and get him and get around. He he has access to people. He has access to probably uh, the church that is there, and he's able to move around and go different places. And he lives in a regular house. Okay. Okay. That's that. that that's what I was wondering because he seems to be giving them some very specific things that they need to be doing. So I was wondering how did he know what the, what they needed? I know the Holy Spirit speaks to him. God is speaking to him and let him know. But I was just wondering, is he observing them when he and I, I guess because he is around and all he's seeing some things that he's telling them what they need to do. Yes. Is that what what's going on? That, that's true. He is saying some things. Okay. And, and, and now remember, he's probably got Roman guards. He may, he may even be have some attached. He may be attached to a Roman guard. 
but he has the ability to to go to and from. He can go in and out. He can move around. Okay. In, in the, yeah, he's not he's not imprisoned behind bars such that uh, that he can't move about. Okay, so it's, it's house arrest. Okay, okay, okay. okay that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? I had a comment, First Lady. All right. Um, when you said about faith, you know, and it brought me to mind that in the beginning, God, it it starts out with faith. Yes. It does not give any justification to where he came from, who he was, or anything, you know, so it starts out the, on faith. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Now, remember what, 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 what Hebrews has to say. Hebrews said what? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. They who come to God, go to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 6. Read that. And then we'll talk about that a few minutes before we jump back over here, okay? Okay. I, th I think it's also in Hebrews where he says, um, in order to have his faith, you, you, you must first know that he is. I mean, we talked about Christology. So having that information, knowing who God is before, before you can develop this faith, you need to be introduced to who Jesus Christ was and what he did. And not, now you got something that you're building your, your faith yeah. on, but that is, that's in Hebrews. That's, that, let, me make sure. let me let me get Hebrews 11, six. That's Hebrews 11, six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, six. So yes, let's go there and take a look at that for a minute. Here, here we are. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, so see what it says there? Without faith, it's impossible to please God because if you come to God, you've got to believe that God is God. Amen. Okay. So back to what you're saying. If we, when we come to God, we have to believe that God is God. And in so believing, then what that does is it sets our faith in motion because he's a God we can't touch, see, or feel other than by the presence and the power of the spirit at work in our lives. So we got it. So, so faith is what it, what, what he, and that's uh, faith. Okay. Right there. Same, same chapter. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith is at work when you can't see what you believe it to be true. It requires faith to go there. And so mm -hmm. that's why verse six and 11 comes back and says, without faith, it's impossible to believe God because you have to believe what you can't see. You can't see God. As a matter of fact, God said, you can't look on him and live. So even if he was outside, you wouldn't be able to look at him. So, so you, you, you with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is the, okay. Faith is the confident expectation that what I cannot see is real. It is, it is, the tr it is my confidence in the unseen. Right. When God said it, you know, it relates to God. I don't have to see it with my physical eye to know that it's there. That's what faith is. The fact that uh, I receive it, accept it uh, based on his word alone. Amen. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, hey, uh, Sister Lundy. Yes. So going back to your, I, I guess it, the verse, I think maybe verse seven. So Epaphras, I guess he was a, he was a representative who, who went back and forth between Paul and Colossus? Epaphras was one of the missionaries that Paul um, probably converted, who went back to uh, Colossae, where he lived and planted a church. So that's who Epaphras is. Yeah, okay. similar to Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians, that yes. he was, in fact, uh, from Philippi that that, in, that, uh, that, that, it, that Paul had encountered. And so is this young man who is from Colossae okay. uh, that Paul has uh, become uh, friends in, in, in ministry with. Right. And he took the gospel message Got it. back to Colossae and probably 
Now, now what you'll see, remember when we were, when we were talking before, the church uh, in Colossae is in Philemon's house. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's why um, Paul probably wrote right around the same time the letter to the to Philemon. To Philemon is the person, not not the not not the people or the church. It is the person Philemon. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, Philemon owns a slave called Onesimus. Right. So we study the book of Philemon. We're going to find Onesimus is the slave. Philemon is the owner. Right. Of the slave. The church met in the city of Colossae. And so, <clears throat> and all of this ties in so well as we start to discuss this letter of Colossae to understand that Philemon um, <clears throat> is, was, became one of the leaders in the church of Colossae, this church that we're talking about right here. And the, but the church meets at his house. He is a person. And you'll see that in Philemon verses one and two. Okay. Amen. <laughs> so let's take a look at this third uh, um, principle here, uh, how where Paul is continuing his prayer, the, the expansion of the gospel. And then thirdly, he says the gospel was transforming their lives. Look at verse six and verse eight. Here, Paul indicates that once the Colossians understood the grace of God in truth, that's what the, look at what it says there in verse six, um, verse, verse six, which has come to you as it has also in all of the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. <clears throat> so, so what Paul is, is, uh, is saying that you understood the truth of the grace of God and because you did that, the gospel has been able to transform your life. See, un until, you, until you deal with God in truth, the power that is necessary for transformation doesn't have a place to go. Mm. Okay. And so here, Paul indicates that once the Colossians understood the grace of God in truth of the gospel, it transformed their lives. It was not just received and passed on. And this is what you got to remember. When God transforms your life, your life by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the truth of the gospel, it requires something of you. It was not just pat, received and passed on, but the Spirit began working in the lives of the Colossian believers to produce genuine Christian love. And genuine Christian love is something that you do. It's not just a feeling that you have. Oh. It cannot be counterfeited. <clears throat> Amen. It's genuine. Okay. So it, questions or thoughts around that? Yes. Amen. Amen. And first of all, I like that. It's, it's something that you do. Yes, it's something you do. Love is not something that you feel. Yes. And, and that's, like the problem, that. that's the problem that we have in our society. We, we mm -hmm. are feely touchy feely people okay good, good feel it i want to feel mine but you got to do something with it it can't just be a feeling right right compassion yeah. is that's love good, and action. Fresh lady. that's good yeah compassion is love and action yeah yes yeah. yes i like that yeah it, it can't just be a feeling it's got to be something there got to be some hands and some feet on your love okay mm -hmm. <laughs> okay all right so, so Paul's point is a love that moves them to action. Remember what I just said? It's a love that it's got to, it's got to have some, it's got, it's got to have some work with it. Agape, not simply a warm feeling or kind regard for others, but is a self-sacrificing, generous love. The Colossians demonstrated that they understood, listen to this. The Colossians demonstrated that they understood the truth of God's grace by serving one another in love. That's how we demonstrate that we understand the truth of God's love, grace. Grace is the truth of God's, of, of God's love. What, is, what does it say grace is? 
Grace is. Come on, somebody tell me what grace is. God's unmerited favor. All right. Mm -hmm. And God's unmerited favor is the truth of who God is. Mm -hmm. and, and when we and when we understand that truth, it motivates us to want to do something. Mm -hmm. That's how we know we're in the family. Right. That's how we know who we are. It's not because of our name, saint, servant, Christian, but it's because of our experience with the truth that has motivated us to step outside of our comfort zone and put our hands and our feet into action so that we do something that makes a difference for the advancement of the kingdom and the building up of the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so agape love then is sacrificial and unconditional. Amen. The expression of agape is always going to have an element of sacrificial uh, attached to it, sacrificial, or, as well as being unconditional, no strings attached. Amen. Amen. So any other comments or questions? I like the engagement. We need to engage. I'm I'm grateful for that. It makes me comfortable. <laughs> First lady, if I may just uh, kind of piggyback on that, just uh, says the Colossians' faith was grounded in the nature of, <clears throat> in the nature of God, I mean, in the nature of work of Jesus Christ. Love flows from faith and proves the genuineness of one's faith. Amen. The Colossians' Amen. sacrificial love for all the saints proves their true belief in Christ. Hope refers to the result of faith, the treasures laid up in heaven where our faith will be fulfilled, where our faith <clears throat> will be fulfilled in the presence of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank That's you for sharing word. that. And, and so back to all that we've, I mean, that just kind of brings together all that we've been saying, kind of brings it all together right there in that one succinct statement about their love about their love. Thank you, uh, Brother Coleman, for, for that, uh, that uh, input. Anybody else? All right, we can continue. All right, and so, and so we, we've come through those first eight verses and now uh, we're going to delve into these uh, last uh, six verses here, six, five, six, okay. Uh, where 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 Paul will talk a little bit more about the preeminence of Christ. And here's what he says in verses 9 through 14. It says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled, listen, keep, keep all this in mind, filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Hold on to that. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the father who has qualified us, keep that word in mind, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. So those are the verses Amen. that we're going to look at now. <clears throat> okay. Seeing, seeing the thread of the deceptive false teachings and anticipating more direct attack, Paul's prayer for the Colossians in verses 9 through 14, pays particular attention to knowledge. You'll see that in verses 9 and 10. In this prayer, Paul, draw, <clears throat> Paul draws their attention from false spiritual knowledge to the intimate and experimental knowledge of Christian faith, love, and hope. Did you see that? I'm going to say that again. In this prayer, mm -hmm. Paul draws their attention from false spiritual knowledge to the intimate, catch that word, experimental knowledge of what is experiment, experiment, experimental knowledge of Christian faith, love, and hope. 
<clears throat> our understanding of how Paul is using the term knowledge in his letter to the Colossians uh, can be illuminated. We're going to talk a little bit about that, about how he discusses this concept in his other letters. Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Here's an example from 1 Corinthians 8. Paul makes an important observation about unbridled knowledge. And remember, we talked about up here, experimental knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Hmm. What's he trying to tell us? Knowledge makes arrogant. That's in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. But love edifies. <clears throat> Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, Colossians 1 and 10. And so the Greek word Paul uses here in this verse is gnosis. The gnosis. Ooh, what did I do? Say that again. The gnosis. 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 Gnosis, okay. It's a general term for intellectual content. Okay, remember that. It, it often refers to spiritual insight. And if you look in Romans and 1 Corinthians, you'll see verses that will kind of give you an idea of what that looks like when Paul expounds upon it in other places in the scripture. Or to accurate knowledge of God, and you'll see that again in 2 Corinthians if you look there, okay, when, in, in the interest of time, <clears throat> I don't know how, how much time I'm, I'm not too bad, okay, <clears throat> interest of time, we don't, we're not going to do that, give us some time to talk. Some false teachers have begun to promote a kind of deep gnosis that went beyond the saving knowledge of Christ as proclaimed in the gospel, narcissism. Is, is the is the is the is the uh, heresy that this word speaks to? Gnosis. They often promise knowledge that goes deeper, or provides an alternative to the simple and unrefined knowledge of the masses. So, so this is what false teaching. This is what this Gnosticism was all about. This is what this heresy was. It was that it was promising that there was a knowledge that would go deeper than just regular knowledge, okay? You know, you, I, you, know, you got a bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree. You got, you got a master's degree, I got, I got a doctorate degree. You got a doctor, I got a PhD, <laughs> okay? So, so that, that's what we have to, you know, kind of get ourselves past, okay? So, so they often promise knowledge that goes deeper or provides an alternative to the simple or unrefined knowledge of the masses, frequently appealing to a person's ego. And that's what a lot of it was. Offering a higher knowledge <clears throat> reserved only for a special elite who can then look down on the average believer who has a simple, supposedly naive faith in mere Christianity. Don't, 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 don't miss that, don't miss that, okay? What these false teachers offered isn't a true knowledge of God, his wisdom, or his will. They proffered a newfangled doctrine, cobbled together scripture in unconventional ways, taking various bits out of context as they hammered out their false teachings. And they used words with which Christians are familiar, but they do so in unfamiliar ways. And so what, what, he's, what he's doing here, what, 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 what Swindoll wants us to understand is how these false prophets actually are able to get into legitimate places and wreak havoc in people's understandings of what's right is because they don't come right out and tell you a lie. They just mix it in with the truth. Mm. Yeah, it, it, the, the ancient philosophers, certainly the Greek philosophers in the time that Paul is writing, uh, always was seeking a, another knowledge or a greater knowledge. This is, a, this is called in theology Gnosticism, where there is a mythical knowledge that is hidden from the general public 
but we who have obtained this quote unquote hidden knowledge or this new knowledge, we know more than you. And therefore, until you obtain this quote unquote new knowledge, uh, you're less than. So this whole notion of Gnosticism uh, surrounds itself with a, a seeking this new knowledge as opposed to seeking Jesus Christ. Paul says, no, I profess to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. Jesus is all you really need to know. <laughs> and, and not necessarily a new knowledge, but a deeper knowledge. I, I, I know more, Mysticism, yes. a more complete knowledge than you have, okay? So, so that's where we are. So we have to be careful how we hear things. And, 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 and here's the thing that, that, that is so deceptive is that three-fourths of it is, is, is all right. It's that one-fourth that makes it all wrong. Hey, so that's what they do. Somebody have a question or comment? Yeah, well, I was just... Go ahead, Wayne. Okay, Pastor, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll... Oh, and when I was looking at it, and I was kind of looking at it a little deeper, it said Paul wanted the Colossians to be wise, but he also wanted them to use their knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge, knowledge of God is not a secret that only a few can discover. It is open to everyone. God wanted us to learn more about him and also put belief into practice by helping others. So, you know. That, that's what I was reading on that. So it's kind of piggybacking on what you guys were saying. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes, you got it. You hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what Paul was doing. Right. right. Okay. Pastor, Paul, did you have something else you wanted to say? I was just going to say, Paul is doing here in Colossians by uh, providing, you know, authentic knowledge and, and the truth about Jesus Christ to overcome Gnosticism similar to what he had to do with the Judaizers in the book of Galatians. Well, the same thing that they came in with, quote unquote, this new, quote unquote, tradition of circumcision, et cetera, et cetera. Paul had to debunk that. And so this letter is similar to the Galatians in that Paul is now giving correct knowledge to debunk false knowledge. Yes. Yeah. And that's what he, he, he was he was bringing his wisdom. Remember what we said up front as we went through the introduction, his wisdom to bear on their circumstances, uh, bringing to them what is true and what is right as opposed to what is false and deceptive, okay? So that's what he's doing here. <clears throat> At this time <clears throat> that Paul is, that this letter was written, narcissism is in its infancy. It has not fully been explored and exploded uh, in, in, in the culture as it will in another uh, time period. So, so now it's at its, it's at, it's at its infancy. And, and I don't think we're gonna look at that here, but we'll look at it down the road a little bit, okay? So, so Here's Swindoll, yes, go ahead. I, it, just a point of clarification. When you're looking at this concept of narcissism, um, it, I think it's, and I see it, I've seen it in several churches, how they build a whole church on a concept of new knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Only they understand it. But do you feel like this Gnosticism was a intentional act of heresy or was that uh, pretty much? Um, Keep in mind, Satan is not gonna miss a trick. So uh, if, he, if he can find a way to keep us from the truth, yeah, you know, it's a trick of the enemy. Paul recognizes that the Holy Spirit gives Paul uh, the, the boldness to speak against that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. It was deliberate. It was deceptive. It was meant to uh, turn them away from the gospel. It, it, it was no different than to me. It just reflects back the Garden of Eden and the conversation with Eve. It reflects God just, you know, God's telling you this because he don't you. He know if you eat this, you'll know as much as he knows. Still trying to look for, seek some kind of a knowledge. But, but keep in mind, because of our innocence and our naivete or, or immaturity, you know, those folks, as she said in the slides earlier, they're more susceptible, you know, babes in Christ. That's why the wolves eat around the, the fringes of the flock, because those who 
are strong in the faith and, 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 and know biblical truth, try the spirit by the spirit is not going to fall for these biblical, these, these lies that, or these falsehoods, we can recognize the, the, the lie. Right. But, but, but what Satan was doing in the garden of Eden was playing against their, their, their innocence and certainly their immaturity and lack of full knowledge. Right. <clears throat> and that's what right. Gnosticism is. Good desire to take what little you know and then take you in a different direction as opposed to taking you straight to Christ and the sufficiency of him. So pastor, what about, I mean, so what is to be said about people who appear to have, um, I can't think of names now, but uh, great knowledge, great knowledge, and then they totally flip. And it's like, how can you have that knowledge? Who, what was the young man with the, um, a uh, 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 million man march who was a Christian and went to represent the Christians. And the next week he, he decided he's going to be a, a Muslim I'm and with all this knowledge. He was a pastor yeah. of a church. I'm not you, can't, name, yeah, Pike, I'm not you, you can't here. Here's the thing about that. People are deceived in many ways. And when your understanding and your knowledge and your, and, and you're not secure in what you believe and understand about God, then you are susceptible for whatever rolls down the road. And so pretty much a lot of us, a lot of people are deceived because of their lack of understanding or their lack of knowledge or the fact that they themselves are looking for something other than what's being offered. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why the Bible specifically says to each believer that you study to show yourself approved. Right. Don't depend right. on the preacher. Don't depend Amen. on your mama. Right. Don't depend. If anybody is led astray, it's because of your lack of knowledge. Because mm -hmm. Christ is going to ask you specifically, mm -hmm. what have you done with Jesus Christ, my son? Mm -hmm. Don't go in the well, I'll church. And he said, I don't want to hear about what your church did. What did you do? And that's I, I, the discrimination. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's a place where he said the very elite, the very elect, the whatever will that's will right. be and can be fooled. So we can't get to the point where no one can to me. I know I, I feel like I can't. Well, we just, oh, I, well, I just can't be tricked. You better be aware. And like you said, go back to what you said, Pastor. Study yourself to be approved because you can right. look up and you in left field and you don't know what right. happened. But Matthew says it this way. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these other things will be added. Amen. Yes. And so, and, and so that's, that's the challenge that we have in, 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 this, in, in, our, in our spiritual lives, in our Christian walk, is that we are laser focused on seeking God. And as we are, then God will bring wisdom. God will bring understanding. God will bring discernment. God will bring wisdom. All of those things come from God as we seek God. And so that's what we have to remember. Paul is, 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 is encouraging this young church. Remember what, we, what I said up front. He's, he's, he's pushing them to get back on track. Go back to seeking the Lord. Go back to what you've already learned. But don't listen to what these people are saying. So that's where we are. And that's where Paul is with his, um, with, with his encouragement, with his prayer, with his um, uh uh, exhortation of this young church at Colossae. Okay. Good, good. If, if I might just read a verse. Yes, go ahead. If I might just <laughs> read a Bible verse study. speaking of <laughs> heavenly, heavenly, heavenly versus demonic wisdom over in James 317, it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first right. pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to the willing to yield full of mercy and good fruit amen. without partiality and without hypocrisy amen amen that's heavenly versus demonic wisdom when we are looking for that wisdom we must yeah. prove that it's from above it's pure very good good discussion y'all good discussion
Good discussion. So can I can I ask a question, First yes, Lady? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, the Bible talks about the secrets of the deep. And I, I, I guess I was thinking something different because it's like, oh my goodness, there's so much more I'm going, I need to, to know or read. But in listening to this, where it says, um, we were increased in knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Is that similar to that same verse, like the secrets of the deep about God? And it's like, okay, so it's got to, I'm thinking it's got to be now the wit, the, the knowledge that we get from God. Now, say that again. You know, okay, the scripture that says about um, God will reveal the secrets of the deep. And okay. I can't, I tried to find that scripture, but I couldn't find it. Um, is that the same as God revealing his it, knowledge to us? Increase well, that we back, were it goes back, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, I think the scripture that um, Deacon Coleman just read kind of answers that. Right, okay. Yeah, if you heard what he said, you would see where- I did. Yes, so, so now kind of put that in line with what he just read, that scripture he just read, and it kind of shows you that the secrets of the deep is the stuff that God is going to reveal. And he's gonna reveal okay. it to you when you are ready. Ready? Okay. God is well, never gonna give us more than we can handle at one time. Yeah, but keep in mind okay. that she's all keep in mind that she's already stated that how shall they hear without a preacher? So God's gonna direct his yeah. knowledge, true knowledge, to those who are truly following him and will empower them and embolden them to speak truth to power. Yeah. So that, that so 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 each individual may not know the truth or have it revealed from God to them individually, but he will make sure that somebody in our midst knows the word of God, the truth of God, and will proclaim it in a public arena. And this is what Paul is doing. Even though he's in prison, God says, I still need you to encourage the, uh, the, the Colossians. And that's right. what yeah. Right. So okay. Even today, we need to we we know the truth. Our, <laughs> ears, get off the slide, our ears will be in tune to the word of God. We Amen. know the truth. Amen. I can tell a lie when I hear it. Amen. You know, if, yes. All right. So let us march on. <laughs> okay. We'll 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 discuss a little bit more. So hold on a minute. We got a little more to go, and we still have some discussion. Don't. This is great. You need. We need to. We need to talk. We need to talk. Here Swindoll quotes Warren Wearsby, and I love this little quote. He says, Satan, and this might answer some of us, is so deceptive. He likes to borrow Christian vocabularies, but he does not use the Christian dictionary. Isn't that profound? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Say that again. Satan is so deceptive. He likes to borrow Christian vocabulary, but he does not use the Christian dictionary. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, awesome. yeah. he, 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 he'll jumble some stuff together and bring, that's what I was saying. He, he, he's not going to, Satan's not going to come at you with an out and out lie. You know, even for those of us who are babes in Christ and, and maybe immature, you know, we really do know the out and out lie. Okay. <laughs> but when you start sprinkling uh, lies in the midst of what is true, then the spirit has to be the one that'll help you discern what is truth and what is false or what is a lie. And so Satan is deceptive and that's what he's saying. He borrows our vocabulary. He knows all of our words. He knows our scripture, but he doesn't bring our true dictionary into whatever he tries to deceive us with. Or he'll mm -hmm. use He'll use Christianese all day long, but he's not going to use what actually has power to make a difference in, in what he says, okay? And so the okay. false teachers in Colossae were twisting the meaning of perfectly good Christian terms like knowledge and wisdom and understanding. The knowledge they were promoting wasn't based on theological truth, and that's what we've been talking about, but on philosophical meandering. So, so it, was, it was not based on truth that we know we can put our hands on, but it was based on 
these philosophies and, 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 and things that are out there that kind of sound like the truth, but when you peel that onion back, there's no truth there. It's just some philosophical uh, words or, or ideology that, that we've sprinkled in with our theological understandings or theological words to make it sound like it's something from God. That's what false teachers do. And that's why we have to be careful. That's why we have to be vigilant. That's why we have to be prayed of. That's how, why we have to study to show ourselves approved. That's why we have to be led by the spirit, okay? Because there's so much deception out there that, you know, some of us might not catch a word that makes it wrong. And so Paul had all of that going on in the church at Colossae. Remember, he said religious pluralism. That means a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. That he's had to deal with based on who he knows God to be and the calling that God has on his life. I'm the apostle Paul. I've been sent of God, the Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Look what he said in verse one. I'm just going back a little bit. By the will of God. Catch that. I, 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 apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. He's not an apostle because the church called him. Hello, somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not an apostle because he's got an MD. He's not an apostle because he's got a demon. He's not an apostle because he got a PhD. He is an apostle by the will of God. Now that ought to shut some of us up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think just a comment, I think that's one of the things our young people kind of run into, I mean, so we raised them in a church and they're in the church all their life and they leave and they go to, well, it's not about leaving that because I think it's in high school, but definitely when you go to college, then they are introduced to so many different things that's, that's um, presented as truth, but it's not truth. And they do use our words and change the yeah. meaning of our words and our young people get confused and they now and the intellect piece where they say, well, they're smarter than we are, right? They go into school and everything and, and can be led astray so fast. So that, that's, that's just a prayer. You have to pray over your children and your grandchildren because confusion, they wait for them to walk out there and they're going to hit them with it. As soon as they get out there with things that um, the opposite of what they've been raised with. Yes, that's so true. That's so true. All right. And so in response to all this is going on, Paul prays earnestly and continually for the believers in Colossae that they would be filled with number one, true knowledge, true wisdom, and true understanding. Look at verse nine. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of him who will in all wisdom and spiritual understand his will the knowledge of his will look at that knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so paul prays for them he said i want you to have true knowledge true wisdom and true understanding of the will of god mm of the will of God, not, not, not just of what's going on in society, not just what's going on in your church, but what the will of God is for your life and for the service that he's called you to for him. Now that was me, I added that, but that's okay, okay? So interestingly, the word Paul uses here for knowledge of God's will is not merely intellectual, or speculative knowledge. The, this word, epigenosis, is a strengthened form of what some interpreted as an intensification of the word gnosis. Or gnosis, there are two ways to say that, depending on who you are. And so these are the words that he's introducing. These are the Greek words 
that that Paul is, is bringing to bear on our understanding so that we have a fuller picture of this word knowledge. That's what he's doing, giving us a fuller picture of this word knowledge. Both words, gnosis and epigenosis, are generally translated as knowledge. However, and, and, and gnosis conveys the idea of just knowing, while epignosis implies a full or complete knowledge, which means to be fully acquainted with or to have a full understanding of. And so what Paul is saying, I don't want y'all to just know stuff. I want you to have a full understanding and be fully acquainted with God through the person of Jesus Christ, by the will and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so, and so Paul here is praying that these believers at Colossae who are being attacked probably on a daily basis by these false teachers who are bringing in all these different philosophies and ideologies and, and, and mysticism and and, 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 and Jewish uh, understandings of things, all of that is rolling into the church at Colossae at one time. It was a smorgasbord of who's who's and who's not. And so Paul's now wanting to, to God to just infiltrate the place with his true knowledge and his true wisdom and his true understanding. And so his prayer for them and, and, and Swindoll says, I love how he's, he earnestly and continually. So earnestly means that, that we are just, we, we're so forceful about it and continually means we just never stop. And that was Paul. And so that's what he's telling us, that we need to be earnest and continual about our prayer for one another about our prayer for the circumstances and the situations that we face, about our prayer for our country, about our prayer for our family, about our prayer for our church, about our prayers for one another. That's what he's telling us. So Colossians is this great book as we start to deal with the supremacy. And, and here's what I love about it. As we start to deal with the sufficient, that Christ is sufficient, well, we ain't gotta worry about tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. Y'all heard that song. Don't make me preach, okay? So, so we don't have to worry about tomorrow because Christ has tomorrow in his hands. We don't have to worry about today because Christ has today. That's what he wants these Colossians to know in his hands. We don't have to worry about right now because Christ has right now in his hands. He is all sufficient for all things. We're going to get to that down the road in this lesson if we get out of this lesson. Amen? And so perhaps Paul's use of this word was meant to rescue the Christian concept of knowledge. I love that. Away from the know-it-all false teachers who were trying to twist the words for their own purpose. That's what he was trying to do as we embarked upon this uh, uh, exhortation of this word knowledge. And, and it's because he wants us to understand what knowledge really is when it comes to our walk and our Christian lives. He wants us to understand that clearly. Paul's prayer that the Colossians be filled with the knowledge of his will was not just for information, but that they have all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It is not just that we want you to have some, some, some information. You know, information has no meaning if it, if, it, if it can't be used. I mean, I got, you should see all these books in here. I got plenty of books. But what really matters is, can I use what I get from them? And that was Paul's prayer. And not only do I want you to have the knowledge of God's will, but I want you to be able to use it. I want you to have wisdom and the spiritual understanding necessary for application. 
That's what he's saying. Now, isn't that a prayer you want to pray for somebody? Isn't that the kind of prayer you want to pray for? You, you ain't got to know what's going on. I pray, God, that, that so-and-so have be filled with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What a prayer. So this kind of knowledge finds its source, and this is what I love, in God through Christ Jesus. And I just finished saying, who is sufficient for all things, Christ Jesus. And it, and it is given to believers, not just to inform them, but to transform them. This knowledge that Paul is talking about, this, this epigenosis, is for our transformation, not just for our information. Okay? And that's what he wants this young church at Colossae to really understand. so that they might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen. So Paul mm -hmm. goes on in verse 10 to highlight three results of receiving the knowledge of the will of God. Knowledge of God's will. I didn't read it like that, but that's what it says. Here's the first one. Three results of receiving the knowledge of the will of God. First result, the way we live will honor and please the Lord. When we know the will of God, when we have received, and, and, and here's what I love about this. It's not just a knowing, it's receiving. It, it becomes, when, when I say receiving, that means that it's not just a head issue, it's a heart issue. Not only do I have the information in my head, but I have the spirit that operates that information in my heart. And because I do, the way we live our life will honor and please God. Everything we do say, everything we think, say, and do will be in pursuit of God's glory. That's the first result of receiving the knowledge of God's will. Okay? First result. The second result of receiving the knowledge of God's will, I'll keep saying receiving, our lives will produce healthy fruit. Notice it didn't just say fruit. Because you can have a big apple, but it might not be sweet. You can have just beautifully orangey, yellowy uh, oranges, but it might not have no juice. And so our lives will produce healthy fruit, true knowledge, true wisdom, and true understanding will produce the theological virtue, this is healthy fruit, of faith, love, and hope, and the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what he wants us to understand. That's what Paul is communicating in this letter, in this prayer. Third, we will continue to grow deeper in our knowledge of God when we receive knowledge of the will of God. Because Christians enjoy a personal relationship with God, our potential knowledge of him is infinitely deep. When we receive knowledge of the will of God, guess what? It, it, it creates in us a thirst for more of who God is. That thirst motivates us to look a little deeper, to grow a little more, to go a little further. That knowledge, that, that, it, it creates a thirst and a hunger for God. And that's what Paul is praying for this church. These are the things we can pray for one another. We, we don't have to know who's in the hospital. We don't, we don't have to know who's going through. We don't know who, we don't have to know who's, who, 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 who's at the job. We don't have to know any of those things to pray for God's people. That's what Paul is doing. Remember, these are the folks he's never met before. These are folks he's never seen. These are folks he's never talked to. 
It's not like he can pick up his, his iPhone and call him. He can't FaceTime him. There is no Zoom. And so we can still do these things. So these are the three results of receiving this knowledge of God's will. Having prayed for the Colossians' complete knowledge of God's will, in verses 11 through 12, Paul prays for their spiritual strength. He had just mentioned honoring and pleasing the Lord by continuing to grow spiritually and bearing good fruit. Now he reminds them that God is the source of the true power that fosters spiritual growth. You, you, hear, that? you hear me, right? You hear that? It ain't because of where I've been. It has nothing to do with, with, with school. It has nothing to do with those kinds of things. God is the source of true power that fosters spiritual growth. And that can and, and we can depend on him alone for everything. Paul emphasizes that it is not, that it is God's glorious might, not our human effort that results in steadfastness and patience. In verse 11, he says that. He says, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, that would be strengthened with all might. And so here's what he says, that, that word steadfast, here's, here's what he's saying when he says steadfastness. It, it is the capacity to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. That's what steadfast means, not just standing, we can always stand, but, but, but you need something more to hold out. This word emphasizes persevering strength exhibited through triumphing in adverse situations. That means we, we can stand strong. We can hold on to our confidence in Christ, knowing that he's going to work all these things together for our good. So Paul, Paul wants them to, 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 to this glorious might, but not our human effort that results in being steadfast. It's the might of God. It's the power and the presence of God in our lives that gives us the strength we need to hold out, to bear up in the face of any kind of difficulty. That's our steadfastness. And then it said patience suggests inner resolve or mental and emotional fortitude. In other words, it's the state of remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome. Patience is the place that we, it is where we need to be if we have to have the peace that passes understanding. We, we need to have patience in order for that peace to manifest itself in, in, in the situations of life as we wait on God uh, to, 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 to come forward, as we wait on God to work everything out for our good. Patience. And so Paul's prayer for them is that they have those things. I like Paul's prayer. Paul knew that the Colossians needed this kind of heavenly strength to be shielded from the flurry of false teachings, challenging their faith in the sufficiency of Christ. And, 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 the, and the news is that not only the Colossians, but we too need this kind of heavenly strength to shield us from the false teachings that have, have overtaken our culture and our society. We got more ideologies and conspiracy theories than you can shake a stick at. And, and, and if truth be told, some of them are in the church. And so we too, like the Colossians, need this heavenly strength. to shield us from the false teachings that and life challenges our faith in the sufficiency of, of, of Christ. God, where are you? When all these things are, are unfolding in my life, where are you? I know that's right. And, and so we also, like the Colossians, we need heavenly strength. 
that, that'll keep us, that'll hold us in the hollow of the hands of our God and shield us from all of the things that would push our faith and make us think that God's not there. That, 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 that he, you know, he worked all his other stuff out, he can't work this out. And so we, we need to know and to be able to stand in the face of difficulties and challenges. Additionally, Paul says that this kind of inner resolve and persevering strength results in joy. Not for the pain or from the pain, not for the pain, suffering, trials or tribulations we may endure, but because God has, and I love this, qualified us mm -hmm. to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. What are you saying, Lord? What are you saying? That you've qualified, you've made us, you've made us available, ready. You've made us it, where we need into what we need to be so that we can now share in the hand. You've made us holy. You've made us saints. You've made us heirs and joint heirs of, 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 of the inheritance that is in Christ Jesus. That's the inheritance of the saints. That's what that is. And, and so Romans 8 says it this way. For I consider that the suffering of this present time, the sufferings of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we have to hold on to our confidence that as God works things out, he's, he's already qualified us to share in this inheritance. We've been qualified through the blood of Christ Jesus, through the cross on Calvary. God qualified us to inherit the kingdom to inherit the kingdom, we've been qualified. We, we, don't, we don't have to go out and ask God, can we be a part of the kingdom? We've already been qualified. And so because our hope for future glory has already been accomplished in Christ, in verses 13 and 14, we're almost there, Paul connects our future deliverance to the past and the present. He doesn't say that one day we will be delivered, but he says he has delivered us, past tense. We've already been delivered. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what he says there. That's what he says there. He says, 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Verse 13. Look what he says, conveyed or transferred a past tense. We're already there. We have already moved from this old house to the new house. It's just a matter of the transition period, the transition time, the transition process. He's delivered us and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of his son of his son's love. This transference of citizenship is a done deal. That's what, that's what Paul wants to convey. And that's what he prays. And he prays that they'll understand this. Because of that, we have redemption, verse 14, present tense. It, redemption doesn't come later. Redemption is right now, which Paul defines as the forgiveness of our sins. I love how he puts that. So, so, so because we've already been delivered, look at this. We have been delivered from the power of darkness and we have been transferred, the scripture says, into the kingdom of the son of God's love. And because of that, we got redemption. We've been redeemed. Means that we've been forgiven for our sins. There's nothing more that we have to do than to be steadfast in what God has given us. Amen. He's already he redeemed us. Uh, Sister Jackie, I'm sitting here burning up, girl. He who has redeemed us <laughs> is the one who has qualified us. And therefore, because he has qualified us, he has transferred us 
into the kingdom. All right. We're really burning preaching. up down here. All right, there. Kathy, are you are you all right? <laughs> all right. Praise God. I'm good. <laughs> to God be the glory. I'm, I'm, to God be I'm the glory. Struggling down here, not to jump in. <laughs> I, I know y'all preachers jumping out your skin, okay? <laughs> So this transfer of citizenship, I want you to understand is already done. There's nothing for us to do but to walk in the newness of life. That's what we can do. So in this opening prayer in Colossians, Paul presents a fascinating relationship between the past, the present, and the future showing that because of what Christ has done in his death and resurrection, the price has been paid, listen to that, to redeem us and to forgive us of our sin. We need to hold on to that. In this prayer, verses 1 through 14 in Colossians, Paul presents this relationship between the past, present, and the future, showing that because of what Christ has done, in his death and resurrection, the price has been paid to redeem us and to forgive us of our sin. Each of us who has trusted in Christ alone for salvation has received this deliverance, deliverance and transference from darkness to light, from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of Christ. This means that our heavenly citizenship has been fully conferred on us. Though currently, during this temporary age, we reside as aliens in this foreign land that we live in. So in Philippians 3.20, Paul underscores this relationship between our present state and our future hope. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven. You need to remember that from which we also eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. We are praying for the knowledge of the truth. And so Swindoll has these applications at the end. We're almost, almost there. And here's what he says. Paul didn't know the Colossians personally, but that didn't stop him. And I want you to keep this. This is something we need to hold on to. That didn't stop him from praying for them faithfully and specifically. Faithfully and specifically. Paul's prayer for the Colossians provides a model for us to remember and emulate. Even when we know people well and are deeply familiar with their struggles and their needs, we should keep in mind the lofty things for which Paul prayed on behalf of the Colossians. Like Paul, let's be faithful in our prayers. We should lift up one another continually. And, and this is so good coming off of our year of prayer for the women's ministry. Let's not wait around to get a list of a person's conflicts and anxieties, needs, or pain. We can pray for people we know or don't know, even if we have no knowledge of their specific struggles. And that's what we want to hold on to. We don't need details to intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can pray faithfully and continually for anyone. Like Paul, we should be specific in our prayers for others. And what that means is that we should pray specifically for the things scripture itself emphasizes as needs that are common to all believers. The prayer in Colossians chapter one shows that we can be specific even for people we don't know. It gives us insight into these very specific things everybody needs. First, pray for knowledge specifically praying that they would discern God's will, that they will stay faithful to the truth, and that they would have critical minds to handle deceptive false teachings. Ask the Lord to grant them deeper wisdom and spiritual understanding to handle skillfully what tests and challenges come their way. So we can pray for knowledge first. 
Second, pray for God honoring lives. Specifically pray that they would know and do what pleases God. Ask that they would yield to the Spirit's inner work to produce quality spiritual fruit and that they would continually grow in faith, love, and hope. Third, pray for strength. Pray specifically that they would have an attitude of inner peace and exhibit endurance. Pray that the Lord would grant them joyful fortitude and the ability to hold up under trying circumstances and rejoice even in the midst of frustrating adversity. Those are the three things we can pray for. And as you pray, know that you are praying according to God's will and that God delights in imparting things that can only come from him. True knowledge, real holiness, and abiding strength. And abiding strength. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I pray that we come to a point where we too know that Christ is sufficient in all things. He is sufficient as our Lord. He is sufficient as our life. And he is sufficient as our leader. Next week, we're going to be in chat in verses 15 through 23. We're going to talk about crowning Christ as Lord of all. Are there any further questions or discussion? I'm going to stop sharing, and then we'll get to see each other, okay? Go ahead and stop the recording, baby. Sister Lundy? Yes. Hey, a uh, quick comment. Uh, 